Good evening, this is John Milburn for Laws 12067, Environmental Law. This is week two of term three, 2017. We have a few people online. Thank you very much for joining us live. The first thing that I note is that some um, people are having difficulty in accessing the discussion feed Ucrew. I'm not sure how widespread it is, but certainly it's my practice and has been for a number of years to encourage students to engage with me in online discussions um, through Ucrew. There is a link available to you on the Moodle website um, for the landing page for this subject. And also through your own landing site, your own MyCQU page, there should be a link. Between terms two and three, the university changed the manner in which it feeds into Ucrew. We were told that it would be seamless, but it hasn't been. So if you've had difficulty in accessing Ucrew, please let me know. Um, better still, I'll invite you to send an email directly to Ucrew support and uh, I'll provide you with a list for, uh, I'll give you the exact email address. Um, I'll place that on um, the Moodle website. I would ask that you please CC me in so that I can uh, ensure that it's followed through. And if you have problems, if it lasts for more than a day, please let me know specifically and I will chase them. I was aware of some problems that arose in relation to introduction to law. I thought that was limited only to introduction to law, but it seems that it's more widespread than that. So if you've had difficulty getting through to Ucrew, don't stress, there is a solution. We'll be able to sort it out quickly, but I would appreciate if you could contact Ucrew support by email, send me a CC if there's any problems directly to me and I will give you the email address on Moodle uh, and I'll do a news bulletin to that effect. Right, are there any questions before we start? Any comments? All good? I'll try not to make the sessions last a full hour, but sometimes when I get wound up, we keep going. So um, firstly, some questions, just to get you going. If you're looking for Commonwealth legislation, where would you look? Quick answers, you can unmute your microphone or you can use the chat facility. Where are the popular choices for Commonwealth legislation? Don't say com law, we don't call it that anymore. We've got an answer coming in. No. There's two that sort of immediately come to my mind. There is Ostley and that's unauthorised, and there is the Legislation Register or the Federal Register, Register of Legislation. So that's authoritative and that is um, up to date. It's free, of course, and it provides information not only about the legislation, but also the bills and the explanatory um, notes, memoranda. Okay, Queensland Legislation, go to Queensland Legislation for the authorised site. Now, I take it you know the, if you don't know these, please let me know through Ucrew or email, but you must be able to access this material. And of course, uh, Ostley, as I mentioned, Jade Barnett is excellent. If you're not already subscribing to Jade Barnett, I encourage you to do so. For example, on the 7th of November, we received through my weekly bulletin, or daily bulletin rather, through um, Jade Barnett, information about a case that might be of interest to you. I'll share the screen and show you what I received as a result of this uh, bulletin. And you'll see there, hopefully, some comments about, or a case, a reference to a case in the Planning and Environment Court in relation to its Sunday Regional Council and Brandbit and Brett Fallon. This was an application heard uh, on the 26th of October for Judge Everson and the uh, judgment was delivered on the 7th of November of this year. And the first respondent fined $15,000. The second respondent fined $5,000 with an order for payment of costs in relation to the application. One thing I do like about the judgments that are recorded in Jade are that there are very easy uh, links, easy to use links. Um, there is other information, which is excellent. So. On the top right hand corner, you can use Jade Case Trace, which is a case citator, and uh, it has excellent um, information 
um, citation reports and reference to decisions used by this case or used by other courts in relation to the case. So if you're not using Jade Barnett, you're doing yourself a dis disservice, you'll miss out on important updates like that. And that um, particular case and the aftermath might be of interest to you when dealing with any assignment work. Of course, in addition to that, courts have some excellent website material. Don't forget the practice directions, in particular for the PE Court Practice Direction Number One of 2016. The Planning and Environment Court website is particularly useful. Okay, so as we fly through some material, does everyone know how to reference their material? Is everyone familiar with the AGLC? Everyone has a guide to using the AGLC. All right, just as a quick refresher, I'm going to share the screen again. Um, one that I like is the, I think, the, I think this might be um, Deacon, I'm just not sure, I'll just check. All right, so you should be able to see some notes. Um, the AGLC, uh, version number three is divided into various chapters. Chapter one deals generally with material. So you should have a ready reckoner when you're preparing your assignments, um, something along these lines, with a quick note of the relevant rule. So every, the reason I'm saying this is almost every um, assignment, I see something wrong in terms of referencing. Most are good, many are very good. Um, some are absolutely perfect. Some, unfortunately, would appear to have been prepared in complete ignorance of the rules relating to the AGLC. So get yourself a quick reference guide. I think there is one that I have placed on the Moodle website, so there's really no excuse. Um, and understand some of those basic rules. IBID above N um, used where a source has been previously cited in a footnote other than the immediately preceding footnote. But don't use that for cases, legislation or parliamentary debates. So there are a few basic rules there. Um, of course, we all know the difference between reported versions. We know the difference between authorised and unreported decisions. Use the authorised report where available. Pinpoint reference to either the page or the paragraph or both if available. And um, judges' names are included unless it's apparent from the text. <clears throat> also, you'll see, um, so there's some examples of how to pinpoint reference using a reference to the um, judgment. There's a note there about how to um, report with medium neutral citation for unreported cases and then legislative materials, journal articles and books. Okay, so we're all good with that. We know how to, to reference using the AGLC. Excellent. If you find a good ready reckoner, a good summary, and you're willing to share it, and I encourage you to do so, please um, uh, provide that information on Ucrew. We'd certainly like to um, have a look at that material. Okay, so we now know where to, to find the legislation relevant to environmental law. We know where possible to cite primary sources of the law as opposed to secondary sources of the law in your material. And we know how to refer to that material by reference to the rules in the Australian Guide to Legal Citations. Everyone knows the difference between the primary source and secondary source of the law. Yes? Want to tell me what it is? It's an easy one. You can just unclick your microphones. So primary is like the authoritative source of the law. What was that, sorry, Jazz? So like primary is like the authoritative source of the law, like the case itself, or the, it could be the study itself, and the secondary source of law is someone referencing that. Yes, and um, probably the most important, and what I think of when I think about the primary sources of law, and thanks for that, Jazz, are uh, legislation and cases. Then, of course, if you have commentary by Jerry Bates or by Fisher, for example, in um, textbooks, they're secondary sources of the law. 
So where possible, cite the primary source of the law. And um, if you come across a case or legislation in a secondary source of um, the law, you don't have to cite that. You just need to cite the original, the primary source of the law for me. Now, we're all comfortable with how the law fits together in environmental law, the Commonwealth, the states, the courts, the executive. We know how that works out. I note looking at the website that no one's provided an answer to problem for this week. So just to, if I've still got this available on my screen. Yeah, I'll just share the screen again so that you know exactly what it is that I'm talking about. And I'll tell you why this is important shortly. So you should be seeing the Moodle site for environmental law. Is that the case? All right. So as we proceed down the web page, down the landing page, oh, sorry, you'll see that's where I'll keep a copy of last week's online session. That will disappear after tonight and be replaced with tonight's session. Through the assessment material, the assessment guides, I'll come back to that, the research and information and other. So there's, there's a link there to my environmental law lectures. You've probably seen that. And there's the chapter comparisons. If you're still working off the eighth edition, that will help you um, if there's a reference that I make to the ninth edition. But what I'm getting to is at the end of most weeks, there's a problem. Now, the idea is that you answer that problem online and share your thoughts. So the problem for this week, week two, relates to the overview of the nature and structure of environmental law. The task provide a short overview of the nature and structure of, of the legislative, executive and judicial branches of government at state and federal level in the context of making, implementing and interpreting environmental law. I mean, that's the sort of exam question that you may be confronted with. So it's a good idea to have your answer ready to go. And don't be too afraid of publishing your answer here. A couple of reasons for that. The first is that if you add to the discussion topic and all you have to do is click this big green button here. I think it's green, isn't it? It's more, it's more green than yellow anyway. So click that button and add your contribution. Why do you do it? First is if you um, have a very good answer, it will, it will um, interest me and I'll remember your name. It's always a good thing for your name to be remembered. Second is, if I think it's not quite right or you've missed the point, I'll just add something. I'll add a polite commentary to it. The third is that if you have got in first and you've answered the question, then others may have to actually cite your work if they wish to borrow your work, for example, in an assignment or an examination. So I encourage you to upload your answers to the weekly problems. It will help you as far as the exam's concerned, the exam's with 50%. There's only a three hour window for this exam. It'll probably only take you two hours to do in all reality, but you've got three hours from which to do it. And um, having your answers ready to go will be very useful if some or all of the questions are closely aligned to the weekly problems. So there's a bit of an exam hint for you. Okay. Any questions so far? We're all good. Well, let's keep going. So you need to understand the role that the governments, um, the, the, the governments and parliaments play, um, the difference between what parliament does, what executive does, how the courts intervene, how they deal with matters, and where the powers come from. You'll need to know the key pieces of legislation, um, at a state, le sorry, at a Commonwealth level, EPBCA, of course, you need to be aware of that, have it ready to go. I'd also consider the Constitution. Have a look at sections 51, 52, and 109 of the Constitution. That is, of course, the Commonwealth of Australia Constitution. 
um, have a look at the Commonwealth Criminal Code. That'll become relevant in about week 10 or 11. And also be aware of the Administrative Decisions Judicial Review Act of 1977. If you know those pieces of um, Commonwealth legislation, then um, you'll have a good grasp of what we need to uh, consider for the exam and environmental law in practice. You, you, of course, don't need to know all of the legislation. You don't need to know it off by heart or anything like that. When you're reading legislation, do you have a particular technique to do so? Just a general question. You look at the EPBCA for the first time. How do you approach it? Even if you're looking for at a specific section. Any uh, thoughts? Yes, Clinton? Yeah, I just normally just have a scroll through the contents to see if there's anything that jumps out. And then if I can't find anything that's really jumping out there, I'll normally go like a search function if I'm doing it online to actually try to find keywords and go through that if I don't have a starting point. I really like that approach. And if we think back to our statutory interpretation days, and I assume you've all done statutory interpretation, you'll be aware that the context and purpose is very important when looking at a section. So be careful about diving straight to a section without considering those wider issues. I like Clinton's approach of looking at the headings, look, get a feel for the overall act and um, using the search facility is an excellent way of doing it. So for example, if you're researching something to do with appeals or reviews, if you add that word in and then search through the act, it gives you a better chance of ensuring that you've covered everything that you need to cover. All right, so that's the Commonwealth legislation, state level, the Planning Act 2016, the regulation that goes with it from 2017, the Planning and Environment Court 2016, and then some others that we'll come across, Vegetation Management Act, Nature Conservation Act, Environmental Protection Act, and one that sometimes people forget, but is relevant for the second assessment, is the State Development and Public Works Organisation Act of 1971. It sounds boring, but it really deals with issues to do with the Coordinator General's role in the environmental law um, executive process. It also touches upon the issue of uh, bilateral agreements between the Commonwealth and the states that we talked about last week. Okay, so as part of your background reading, be aware of those um, pieces of legislation. I would really encourage you, time permitting, to look at uh, uh, the relevant regulations that go with those, particularly for the Planning Act. And when we're talking about legislation, and understanding legislation, where else do you think I would encourage you to look to get a better feel for what this legislation is all about? Think back to statutory interpretation. Any thoughts? It's the, I'm guessing you're talking about when they read in the, the legislation opponents, so the, um, when a politician raises it, I can't, I've forgotten the name of it. Yeah, the Definitely reading. on the right track. Yeah, uh, Hansard. Yep, Hansard, second reading speech, yeah, explanatory reading. notes, explanatory memorandum. That's um, exactly what I was great resource. We'll have a look in a moment at how to get to those things. Okay, so documentation. My stated aim is to try to tailor this course where I can in a practical manner. I'm going to share the screen, just give you an idea of some documentation. So if you're in the Planning Environment Court on a merits review matter, your client may wish to appeal to do something. So here we have just a basic pro forma where someone appeals to the court against a certain decision. You set out what the decision is and seek following orders. So when you go to a court, you make sure that you have the right court. Um, you specify what it is that you complain about and you state what it is that you want the court to do. So what do you want the court to do? Well, if it's a merits appeal, 
You probably want the appeal to be allowed, that is the merits appeal if you're the developer, and the development application um, refused um, or refused, depending if um, you're acting for the applicant or the respondent, you want further orders as the court thinks is appropriate, and you then set out the grounds of the appeal. So you might have some general grounds of appeal. Um, the proposed development conflicts with the planning scheme and is not sufficient grounds to justify approval. So this, for example, might be a submitter appeal, a person who has submitted against a pro proposed application that was approved, goes to the Planning and Environment Court on a merits appeal and says the approval should be overturned because the development which is approved conflicts with the planning scheme. There's not enough ground to justify it despite the conflict with the planning scheme. But the development has an adverse impact on the environment and then other things. So one of the cases that you might see that I've used in the past for um, assessment purposes was the Predijon case involving uh, a development and um, there, are, there are some grounds that might be raised in a case. So when you're reading a case, the point that I'm trying to make here is this. When you're reading a case, to some degree, think backwards so that if you're a practitioner in an environmental law and you're advising an applicant developer or a council, which is the respondent, um, uh, the assessment manager, or you're acting for an environmental group, you need to know where to take your argument and you need to know basically what the format of your argument will be. What are the general grounds for your argument and what are the specific grounds for your argument? And one way to get used to that idea is to read a case actively so that when you're reading a case, you're thinking in your mind, what would the document have looked like at the start to get this into court? And you can tell that there are certain grounds that are um, relied upon in seeking an order, which become apparent when reading the case. Also, when you're dealing with um, cases, think about how people may have formulated those arguments in order to get there. That'll be relevant for the, f the last part of your assessment, number one, where you have to come up with some hypothetical appeal points. Just sharing the screen briefly again. The other thing that you might want to do is seek an enforcement order. So for example, in Fraser Coast Regional Council against Brown Brothers, the Planning and Environment Court um, made an order in relation to, or well, the, the applicant sought an order by way of enforcement pursuant to 601, 601 of the Sustainable Planning Act now repealed and replaced. So that gives you an idea of the enforcement function available in the court and what it is that you might seek as part of that um, function. So when you're looking at a case, you may have to consider an appeal from the decision. And when we're talking about environmental law, the appeals that we're talking, discussing relate to two types of things. The first is an appeal from the original decision of the assessment manager, which would generally be an appeal to the Planning and Environment Court or to the um, resolution, uh, to the, dis the dispute tribunal. Let's look at the second line of appeal, which is from, say, the Planning and Environment Court to the Court of Appeal. This is relevant to your first assessment. And to give you an example, I'm just going to follow through with a link, which I immediately lost as soon as I got it. I'll regain it and I'll share the screen. So this is just making it a little more real. So here, for example, we have an extract of a file summary taken from Queensland courts 
in relation to a case of Fraser Coast Regional Council against Walter Elliott Holdings, P Peter Wall TD. And you'll see there that in Brisbane, there was an appeal where in the Supreme Court, there was an application to seek leave to appeal the decision of the Planning and Environment Court. The final order in that case was made by the full court in 2016. Now there's a bit of a problem with that file summary. And if you've followed through on some of the suggestions that I made last week, in looking at these file summaries, you'll see that the documents are not available for you to look at. What would be terrific for your um, assessment would be to look at, say, the applicant's outline of argument as to why the appeal, uh, why the court should give leave to, to allow the appeal, because that's the sort of thing you have to do for your assessment. You need to come up with some arguments as to why the Court of Appeal should consider an argument to overturn the original decision by the Planning and Environment Court. So that's just an example of what it looks like in the court's website. Now, does everyone know how to get to that area that I just showed you on screen? All right, we'll have a look at that soon. No? Okay, good. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, when we're talking about planning and environment court, when we're talking about environmental law, don't forget the important role of alternative dispute resolution. Um, an extract from the District Court of Queensland annual report from 2012 says that the ADR service in the Planning and Environment Court received international recognition as providing visionary ADR access to justice. So ADR is a very important aspect of the Planning and Environment Court, the Land Court, and the Development Tribunal generally. So the point there is, it's likely that if we're talking about access to justice, we're talking about the procedure for enforcing environmental laws, that you need to provide some discussion about the alternative dispute resolution options. Where is it, do you think, that you will find specific detail about the mechanics of ADR in the PE court or the land court? Where would you look if your client comes to you and says, Tell me about what's involved in getting a matter before an ADR registrar in the Planning and Environment Court. Any thoughts? Those of you in the recorded sessions, watching the recorded session, go scurrying now, pause and go scurrying to look. Those of you live, you're at a distinct disadvantage. And if you're watching this as a recorded session and say, oh, I knew that answer, well, join us live and you can tell us. All right, so where would you look? What are the options? We're looking for the law relating to the mechanics of planning and environment, for example. There's legislation. There's regulation. What else is there? What's the next level? I'm not suggesting it's less important, but it probably sits below regulations. Very important if you're in practice. That's a big hint, the word practice. All right, practice directions. So you need to look at practice directions. So I've already mentioned tonight briefly to look at practice direction number one of 2016 from memory. And I glossed over that pretty quickly, but I'll get you to go and actually find those. So have a look at the p and &E Court Practice Direction number one of 2016. While you're at it, have a, a, a look at the index for all of the p and &E Court Practice Directions and identify the one that relates to the process for defining ADR practice in that court and have a read of it so that you're aware of the practicalities. 
So if there's a question in the exam about ADR and you fail to identify the important function of practice directions, you'll struggle to do well. Also, um, have a think about the areas of practice for both the Planning and Environment Court and the Development Tribunal. The place to look for that is now in the schedule to the new Planning Act, Queensland. All right, so speaking of Queensland and Act, test your memory here. What, um, what information would we, would I like you to look at to supplement the Act? I'm not talking about secondary sources, I'm talking about something that's on the legislation website. That's a bit cryptic, that question. The bill, perhaps, what else? In Queensland, we call it the explanatory note, also the second reading speech. But I think probably the explanatory note's the important thing. How would you find the explanatory note? Let's say the Victims of Crime Assistance and Other Legislation Amendment Act of 2017. Where would you find that? Was it 16 or 17? One of the two. Where would you find the explanatory note to that piece of legislation? We talked about it tonight, a bit of a memory test. The reason I'm coming back to it, circling back to it, is you can tell that I think it's important. The fact that I also take statutory interpretation has something to do with it. All right, so we would look in the Legislation Queensland site, or we would look at OSLI. Let's have a look at Queensland legislation. Uh, firstly, I'll just share the screen. How to find explanatory notes. This is in Queensland legislation. So you'd go to bills at the top ribbon. We'll do that, we'll go through this shortly. After finding the status information, page for the bill, or uh, click the legislative history, scroll to the bottom, and you'll see explanatory notes. Let's put that into practice. We'll go to the Queensland legislation website. And if you've got access to your computer now, you might want to do the same thing. So Queensland legislation website. We go to bills. I would suggest we go to by title most of the time. We're looking for the victims of crime Assistance and Other Legislation Amendment Act. Click on that and you'll see here legislative history in the ribbon at the top. Click on that and that's the extract that we showed you previously so that you can see the explanatory notes for the um, introduction, the second reading and uh, second reading. Uh, sorry, normally it's the second reading. In this case, it's the third reading. Uh, in both PDF and Word version. So that's one way to get to the explanatory note. Common Auth, we call it explanatory memorandum. The other way, possibly simpler, is to go through Ostley. And if we go to Queensland legislation, You'll actually just see it down the bottom. Queensland Bill's explanatory notes from 1999 onwards, so not all of them. Go to the Victims of Crime, Assistance and Other Legislation Amendment Bill. Where did that go? 
disappeared on me. Explanatory notes. There it is. Just took a while to come up. Okay, so there's a couple of ways that you can find the explanatory notes. Have a look at that when it comes to um, understanding the sections. So if you're reading section 27 of the Planning Act, you think, I don't really quite understand what they're getting at. Have a look at the explanatory notes. Have a look at the second reading speech and it'll be laid out for you. Um, so if you're thinking about what's the intent, what's the purpose, that's the most authoritative answer. And you will do well in your assessment work in your exam if you quote to me material from the explanatory notes or the reading speeches. I know you're saying, gee, that's a lot of work for me to do because this is a huge textbook and I've got to read all this legislation. And now you're telling me I've got to read cases and explanatory notes. But you don't have to go into a lot of detail and don't, don't be bogged down in too much of the detail. Pick up on the key points is the, the important thing. And showing that you have the ability to research and identify important parts of um, the research is, is um, where you'll do well in the assessment. All right, so now I know that we've had a problem with UCRU for at least one student. Um, are others going on to UCRU? Okay. If you come across something that's good, please add it. If you want to assist a student who's having problems and asks a question on UCRU, please do so. If you're having problems, please ask your question on UCRU. People sometimes send me emails and I'll provide a response with a, a further note saying, that's a great question others might want to know. They probably want to know my response. So would you do me a favour and ask on UCRU and I'll repeat the response. Okay, so um, Jazz said legislative history on the legislation website. Yep. So you should be now familiar with UCRU. You should have been through the Moodle site. You should have looked at the assessment pieces. You should have looked at the material that is relevant to the assessment. And you should be starting to map out your assessment. I'm, I'm a big fan of having the skeleton prepared right at the start. So, and knowing the questions that you've got to answer in your assessments, if you come across something that you think is relevant to that, then you can feed it into some notes as you go so that it'll act as a reminder. But when you do come to prepare the assessment, you need to do so in accordance with the guidelines that I've established, which for those of you that have worked with me before, you'll be familiar. And there is of course the um, sample document and uh, the assessment guide that I've prepared. I think we looked at these last week. I'm just going to look at them very briefly now. I'll share the screen. And the two documents are the written assessment guide, which sets out some basic rules, at least relevant to me, possibly to other unit coordinators. The reason I wrote that document is that I was getting um, material where people just simply weren't following some basic guidelines. So do read that. You'll find that on um, the website, the Moodle website. And the other thing is a sample document, just to give you an idea of the way in which I'd encourage you to consider setting out a document. This one doesn't have a cover sheet. I actually like cover sheets. Um, it does have footnote referencing. It is set out in a manner that appeals to me. But having said that, um, others present documents in a more professional manner than this. So don't feel constrained by it. It does include a writing style which is to my liking and that is generally for the use of short sentences, which for example, on the bottom of the page there, can pack a punch and draw the attention. So write as if you are the educator, write with authority. Short sentences gets to the point, conveys the message very well. You can use lists, but be careful about that. I think it's tempting sometimes to have a long list, but I tend to gloss over those if I'm reading them. 
Others may or may not have that same problem, I'm not sure. And of course, with the assessment, make sure that it's on time. And if you need an extension, please apply before the assessment is due, not after it's due, otherwise I won't be able to consider it. I take it you're all familiar with IRAC, Issues, Rules, Application and Conclusion. You're probably using that for each of your subjects. I'd encourage you to do so for this subject. Now, as everyone found on Moodle, my guide to Bates, the weekly guides, and I think it's also, it's probably in um, the weekly lectures. So for Bates, the eighth edition, I went through and summarised. Have you found those? Have you found my environmental law series of lectures? I think there's a link. So they're included in there as well as some other things. We've talked about the importance of writing some answers to the weekly problems. I won't go through those with you specifically, but I do encourage you to consider those. For this week, from Bates, from Chapter 2, um, I'll identify some important paragraphs for you to consider. I'd like you to read them all, but in terms of the most important parts, read paragraphs 2.16, 2.28, 2.29, through to about 2.4. Um, before that, 2.20, 2.22, and then on to 2.35 and 2.38. So those paragraphs that I've rattled off pretty quickly cover, I think, the main issues from week two. From week one, you should have already read 2.5 as an important um, paragraph. Deals with separation of powers and goes to that first assessment. So that first workshop question. So those um, paragraphs that I've talked about relate to separation of powers, the role of the common law, and also how legislation has had to overcome the common law, particularly in relation to private rights and compensation for acquisitions of property. They're referred to in the, in the paragraphs that I've mentioned. We mentioned earlier tonight the Constitution. Have a look at Section 51, subsection 31, which deals with the acquisition of property on just terms think the castle. And there's some leading cases that I want you to consider. The EPA against Rashley, Spencer's case, the um, a decision in the High Court in ICM Agriculture against the Commonwealth. That was referred to in the case of Arnold. All of these are in the text. Sometimes you need to look in the footnote to find some of these things. Arnold, for example, is in the footnote. And um, acquisitions generally. Uh, then the other material that I've asked you to consider deals with the role of science and the importance of NGOs in environmental law um, matters, particularly as far as the executive is concerned. Now, I did indicate that I'd try not to go the full hour each week. I haven't done a very good job. I hope I haven't moved too quickly. I know that I've circled back a few times on key issues. I won't keep doing that. But I think you know now what I regard as important. And I particularly want you to be able to access the material so that you can find things for yourself. Oh, there is one thing that we touched on that I haven't come back to. And that is the issue of finding file summaries. I referred you to one, but not more than that. So where did I find that file summary? I'll just share the screen again, just to remind you of what it is that I'm talking about. That was the file summary in relation to the Walter Elliott case. <clears throat> where did I find that? 
big hint at the top left hand corner Queensland courts okay has anyone had a look at these file summaries I'd urge you to do so how do we get to those well if we go to court Queensland can anyone tell me on that page where I should start to look would it be courts what was that courts courts yeah then the, uh, mm. the planning environment court look that'll give you good information generally but not specific documents about the matter uh, of a particular case that's a, that's a good a good attempt but not the one i'm looking for marjorie do you know services what was that sorry services services no again not would the be, one i'm looking for would it be search civil files yeah that's the one i'm after so let's have a look at search civil files okay so now what do we do <clears throat> let's say um we're looking for a case involving fraser coast regional council if we go to party search now it's starting to look a little bit like what i showed you earlier so let's go down to party details and in include fraser coast regional council and I mentioned the Brown Brothers case or the Byrne Brothers case. Um, I'll just show you this. You've got to be exact. So Byrne Brothers in full won't lead you anywhere, but Byrne Bros, full stop, PDYLTD, will. If we insert those details and search, now this is not a reported decision. This is just the actual documentation. It'll give you this result. And if you then go to view the details the important thing about this is from a practical point of view down the bottom it will actually give you the documents that were filed in court that was the missing link as far as the earlier decision to the court of appeal is concerned but if you want to get an idea of what an originating application looks like for planning an environment court matter or an affidavit or an entry of appearance or an order or anything of that nature, this is a good way to get a feel for it. It'll also give you an idea of the sorts of things that are included in material that is presented to the court and it provides you with an overall summary of the events. If we go back and you don't know all the details, you can just choose anything you like. So if we delete the respondents details and we put in um, say, cans it should work that the search will now identify all matters involving the cans regional council are they called regional council or city council i'm not sure there it is cans regional council so and, and it's not just planning and environment court matters it's other matters as well uh, for example uh, personal injuries matters but the thing about the planning and environment court matters is that when you look at the file details, not only does it include commentary about the parties, the events, but it has the documents as we saw earlier. That can be a, that can be a handy resource if you're looking for precedence. So have a look at that. Just get a feel for it. And you'll also find practice directions through the court's website and um, uh, you'll find listings for information about mediations and court cases generally. Also consider Jade Barnett and if you're not subscribing please do so. Okay just finally um, I probably should have given you a little bit more reading for week two. Just looking at my notes. Yeah two point I've given you most of the paragraphs. What I haven't talked about 
uh, matters involving Indigenous Australians and um, Terra Nullius, we might deal with that next week. Okay, any questions? All good? All right. Thank you for your patience and your attendance. I really appreciate it. And we'll see you next week. All the best. Thanks, John. Bye. Bye.